Um, welcome everyone. Um, to today we're going to do a session on basic principles of statistical parametric mapping technique. Um, it's going to be very basic. Uh, we have people also in Leuven, uh, in Belgium, physiotherapists there that are a group are following on Skype and also people in Ghent, physiotherapists who are following uh, again in Belgium. And here we have a group of people that are some PhD students I see, some um, teaching assistants, former PhD students, research officer, motor control people um, and lecturing staff uh, all together um, to try and um, follow. Uh, I will address several things. I will first address what we think the problem is, then I will offer a solution, then I will explain the principles of that solution and how you can then apply that by some examples that we have already done in our work and then we will follow the session with questions. Because we have this complicated technical setup, I suggest that I first go through the presentation and then we do the questions uh, after that so that we can focus on the questions uh, in one go. Um, okay, so let's try to identify what we think is the problem. Well, when we do biomechanics, so I'm just proceeding in one slide to the uh, hand in the water there, which actually uh, indicates that very often people drown in data and we see motor control people here uh, I believe that they also have sometimes that problem drowning in data which has all sorts of things and what we need to identify is well what is really our problem when we drown in, in data so let's try and move forwards one slide so what do we know of our problem well, very often if people explain what is the problem that we have, then it could be explained by just looking at these two graphs here. These are two graphs um, of some data and what you have is you want to know certain differences between these two curves. So what we do is we either take a peak of the curve or we measure the time when a peak arrives or we say well actually we want to know the whole curve how it's different so we do statistics of on each of these 100 data points now that's why we know that we're doing a problem because we are testing many more times which means that we are likely going to find differences based on the fact that we have tested so many times this is to do with probability so when you actually do these 100 comparisons and you identify that there are certain um, zones that are we consider uh, are different then really we are making statistical errors with that so we have a problem there can we do that? Well, we better not do it. Now, the real origin of that problem lies with our hypothesis making. Because really, if we do a study, we don't always just start doing that. We try to identify what our question is on our study. And the typical question that we have in biomechanics actually has a flaw in it. It tends to say, controls and patients exhibits an identical maximal knee flexion at 30 degree uh, 30 percent of stance during walking for example that would be what we would call a very directed hypothesis it's your null hypothesis that you state so you state there's no difference but it's a directed hypothesis it's very focused however in biomechanics we don't tend to work like that what you should actually identify typically is we have controls and patients exhibit identical knee kinematics during stance phase. That is really how we should say it, which means you're not focusing on one particular part of the stance phase, but on the whole stance phase. And you're also not focusing on knee flexion necessarily, you're focusing on the full kinematics of the knee, which means the three planes of motion. So, what this then leads us to is we have all this data here that we struggle with, which is our problem that we identified. But the problem that we have is then the scope of our null hypothesis should not be changed after seeing the data. Because what we want to do then is we then want to go to our directed hypothesis and actually first observe the data, find where there is something meaningful within the data, and then we will only report that, which means that we actually make a very important error there. It's a, an error of bias. So that is the origin of the problem. 
So if we now consider what we typically do, well, we have very often one-dimensional data, we call it. Why do we call that one-dimensional data? Well, it is data that has a dimension of time associated to it. If you have zero-dimension data, then it means you have one data point, a discrete value. If you have one-dimension data, this is this, but in biomechanics it even goes further. We very often also have two-dimensional data. And we tend to reduce that. So we look at zones of foot pressure, for example. We have that in time, so we have a dimension of time that we tend to collapse by looking at average pressures or pressures during a certain moment in time. Uh, and then we reduce the area by looking at particular zones. So we reduce our data twice from two dimensions typically to one dimensions. Uh, sorry, to, to zero dimension data. And finally, you can also consider that there are multi-dimensional data available in biomechanics, amongst which, for example, this here would be pressures on a bone that is a three-dimensional surface. And again, you have time there coming in, so you have multiple dimensions potentially that you want to observe, uh, which means that you have basically a reductionism, uh, reductionism that's taking place. So how do we deal with that in biomechanics? Well, this is what we do. We have typically the curve, we take some variables from it and we put it in a table. And what then happens is we don't even present the curve anymore. So that this here gives you very abstract zero-dimensional data. With multiple comparisons, we know that's a problem, but hey, you know, we haven't got another technique to do it. Another example is we have two-dimensional data from these different zones, so we identify the zones, uh, hallux, uh, the, the metatarsals, we have the heel, etc. Uh, and so we basically uh, identify those different zones and we identify again an abstract value where again we don't even tend to present the actual um, uh, I would say the specific um, construct of that data anymore. Uh, this here is the three-dimensional data and here you can probably see that this becomes very very difficult to really interpret what's going on. So what we are looking for is a technique where we can actually avoid doing all these reductionism aspects which lead to statistical bias. Now what is something other that can help us in this problem that we should take into account and it's something called spatiotemporal smoothness. Data is associated to each other and on the right hand side of this slide in the biomechanical data what you uh, can see there is a, a, a pot of paint that's been spilled. It's multiple types of paint that are being spilled. Now if you actually look at that pattern there, that image, then you can see that they are actually smooth in the way they behave and biomechanical data is the same. Our force curves that we have tend to be to an extent smooth curves, so they are not purely random. That means that my point zero and my point one and my point two and my point three in my curve is actually not entirely independent. They are associated to each other because it is something that is behaving in a smooth fashion. And it's the same with pressure data where they are particularly smooth also associated towards certain areas in space will be associated to the area right next to it actually. They're not entirely independent in their behavior and the same with pressures on bone for example. So that is something that as long as we sample above what we call the Nyquist frequency is an inherent component of our data. A second aspect of our data is that they are bounded and that's where we mean that they are physically associated with each other. So one thing that we all know is a, kin a kinetic chain is actually dependent on each other so that means they're not totally independent of each other. But again, if we look at the foot, for example, pressures under the foot are actually associated with each other based on the integral anatomy of the foot. So that's something that you need to take into account in your analysis. Because of those aspects, because of being bounded, you can also register them. That means that very often phenomena when you repeat a phenomenon, then you can actually register them. That means you can time normalize forces, for example, because they are bounded to a certain principle, the actual relative uh, phase in time is still meaningful. 
rather than purely looking at an abstract phase in time, but equally well, the relative locations of pressures in the foot pressure measurement are also bounded to each other in a way that we can register that. We can register that towards what we would call, for example, a standardized foot. So it allows you to register your data, which very often people refer to as temporal and spatial normalization, but we tend to refer more towards registration as a technique. Yeah? Um, and so that's where we basically have identified the problem. The problem is that in biomechanics we tend to have non-directed hypotheses. Remember, we start typically from looking at all the data. Before we then might formulate a directed hypothesis, it's a very bad way to, to deal with data. We have data that we tend to explore in 1D, and let's just focus on this one-dimensional curve data. Um, but actually, we analyze it in 0D. So that's a, a, a problem that we have, and we then end up representing our data in a very abstract form. However, in applied biomechanics, and I have to particularly then think about those people who are in a clinical field, for example, and using biomechanics, or who are in a sports context and using biomechanics, the actual papers that are being published in those environments tend to be actually based on what we call zero-D exploration. So the one-dimensional exploration is not even done anymore. There's a parameter that is being taken out as a discre discrete value, and all the information surrounding where that data comes from is actually entirely ignored in many cases. Um, and this is to do with an understanding of how we deal with that data. Um, so, biomechanical data are in 1D, 2D or 3D, they are smooth and they are bounded. And so now, now is the, the principle that applies. So what can we use there to deal with that? And that's where statistical parametric mapping comes in. Um, so, if we then look at statistical parametric mapping that was originally developed for analysis of cerebral blood flow uh, from 3D fMRI. So there you go, you've got a three-dimensional piece of information. And if you remember any of those pictures that you see on the right there, then you can spatially immediately see what is happening. So imagine that a surgeon or a neuro neurosurgeon or a neurological person would actually have to take this information away and only interpret data based on values in a table, it would make their work totally impossible. And so that's why in this area, people have developed a n-dimensional methodology, which is the statistical parametric mapping. An n-dimensional, that means you can use one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional, four-dimensional, which becomes very difficult for us to visualize, but you can actually analyze that. It is associated with suitable, sorry, it is suitable for smooth and bounded fields, which these brain scans actually have. Areas are associated to each other, and their activation patterns are not at random. I'll come back to that point. In this area, people have extensively validated this technique and um, one of the main papers and one of the main people who have been working on this is Friston, uh, where he actually had more than 6,000 citations on his paper, primarily from this particular area. Um, and if you now type in SPM uh, in Google Scholar, for example, you, you, you have a lot of results. However, in biomechanics, we don't have it. So that's where we've been working um, very hard to try and bring that into biomechanics. It's even to such extent that in MRI analysis now, if you want to publish MRI papers, you're not even allowed anymore to do any analysis that is uh, other than statistical parametric mapping. So it's become the standard. So what we would uh, want to have is that eventually, maybe uh, with uh, work, years of work, we might actually come to the same point. So, what are the advantages for biomechanists? Well, if we now look at SPM biomechanical advantages, then we first of all see that there's no need for discretization, so you don't have to reduce your data. And that means you can keep looking at the full trajectory, and you can observe the full trajectory, which means you can do your observation, and then your statistical analysis, which is the bottom part of this slide, in the same way. <laughs> 
without having to reduce your data first before you then do your analysis. So you can actually allow for non-directed hypotheses. You no longer have to set that reduced hypothesis, which was probably set after you've done an overall observation of your data.